those of you who don't know Tim, Tim's been a veterinarian for many years across New South Wales, I hope I get this right, Queensland and the UK. So he's traveled around a fair bit, has lots of experience. And he now resides over in the west of our state here at New South Wales in Dubbo, where he has a um, sheep veterinarian service called For Flock's Sake, which uh, gives you a bit of an insight of those of you who don't know you to Tim's sense of humor. So you will get, as he unprompted for those of you who follow him on socials today, you'll get a bit of, um, Tim's humour coming through in some analogies that he's worked out for you today. So I don't have your presentation up yet, Tim. Hey, we're rolling, I think. Okay. Oh, yep, yep. Oh, no, it's gone again from me. Oh, hold on. That's my flicked a button there. There we go. Show my screen. Go again. Two seconds. There we go. Best laid plans, as they say. We practice. There we go. Perfect. Have you now, Tim? Take it away. Uh, thanks, Fiona. <clears throat> no uh, plan survives first contact with the enemy, uh, and uh, certainly audiovisual play into that. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to today's uh, webinar. Um, really, we wanted to kind of go back over some of um, the RAM management. We've talked a little bit about it in Ramping Up Repro, but really a bit of a focus on brucellosis, which is you know a disease that has significant e economic impacts. So we're going to kind of roll through that and you know what you can control. Um, you know, I suppose everyone, um, you know, last year 2022 and so many facets was such a, a moving beast. Um, so we really want to think about what can we control in our environment. So, like Fiona said, um, my name's Tim Gohl. I've been a vet uh, for, I think, about 17 years now, which is pretty exciting. I started this business called For Fox, Flock's Sake. One, clearly, I think I'm funny, but really the purpose of our business was we wanted to help producers grow their best sheep and make every year a winner. Um, and it's really important to us to try and make, uh, I suppose, a r advice and science relatable, and this is um, all part of it. So. In the next 40 minutes, what I'd like to do is, you know, really trying to cover a couple of key um, key points. One, brucellosis, what it looks like, what it does, what's the impact on your farming operation or your sheep operation to having it, how can you manage the risk of brucellosis, and how do we manage that in the, I suppose, context of our RAM team, and finally, you know, where to next for our um, program for our guys. So I'll just pull this up. So. Brucellosis, what does it look like? Well, in a nutshell, that's what it looks like. Uh, basically, what we see with brucellosis is it's a bacterial disease that infects sheep and typically causes ramp infertility. Now, I'll just make sure I'm really clear on this. It's brucella ovis we're talking about. There's a couple of different brucellosis, I suppose, um, bugs out there, but we're talking about brucella ovis, so one specific to sheep. So uh, the good news is, and um, what we're going to talk about today, if you're running goats on the side or cattle, we don't have to worry about any of those things. So typically we think about it as a ram infertility disease. Uh, and the main method that brucellosis spread is typically ram to ram during a sexual contact. So by and large, we think of it as a venereal disease. And rams have got ample opportunity to spread it amongst themselves because you think about it, you know, what are we up to? Maybe 40, 46 weeks of the year, uh, they're going to run as a single sex solo team. So plenty of op opportunities. Uh, how does it express itself or how, does, how do we see it typically? Is this this hard and irregular shaped testicles? And this is a, a border lester ram um, that I uh, tested for brucellosis a while back. And you can see here, you know, it's it's pretty obvious that they're pretty big and, and out of, I suppose, out of whack. And that's what we see clinically, typically. So what does it look like? Here's a, a, a picture from the side on view of a ram with some anatomy. You know, so we've got the testicle here, um, we've got the epididymis. Now the epididymis is the, I suppose, the maturation facility for the um, testes. Remember the testes are just a sperm factory. That's where the sperm gets made. Um, they kind of go into the epididymis and the epididymis kind of in my mind um, forms the same function as wine barrels to a vineyard. Just helps that kind of uh, wine or the grapes uh, mature a little bit. From there, you know, it goes up, 
up through the epididymis, out through the sigmoid flexor. So bull, uh, ram, sorry. Um, I've got a really big sigmoid flexure coming out here, uh, which explains why bladder stones in rams is such a huge problem because you've got this huge S bend that's really hard to clear stones. But so basically when a ram uh, gets uh, brucellosis, the bacteria goes into the bloodstream, it finds its way down to the testes and that's where it really loves. It loves setting up camp. In the testes, what it does is it causes abscessation, so forms an abscess, can form an abscess, and really causes damage and infection to this epi epididymis region mainly. You know, you can get some severe blockages of the epididymis, um, and you can get some spermatoceles where they've ruptured and the sperm forms a bit of a kind of hard lump, but also the testes is damaged. One of the big things also I think about a little bit is that we have uh, anything that affects the RAM will affect the factory. So if they've got an infection of any type, then that's going to affect their ability to for sperm production. So as you can see here um, with the green arrow, that that's typically where we see it. And when we feel or palpate um, testicles and look for brucellosis legions, that's typically where we're feeling. And you know, I was down at um, the Wyvern uh, weekend the other weekend, you know, explained a few of the you know gun young students who were there. And it's one of those things, once you felt a whole series of um, normal testicles, rams of brucellosis are stand out really, really obviously, by and large. I'll come back to that point. So once a ram gets infected, uh, it, I suppose its sperm is contaminated by bacteria um, in about three weeks. So what this means is that it is an ability in rams that are very sexually active, which is right now, because remember sheep are short day breeders. So, you know, where we're up to start of March, we're peak breeding. So a lot of sexual activity happening, even in single sex groups, because that's a dominance thing now, isn't it? So we get a lot of spreading at this time of year and the bacteria, um, once it's in the ram, takes three weeks to go out. So why that's important is when we come back around to talking about eradication, we have to be super aggressive and we've got to find those animals um, before they start getting infected and excreting the bacteria. So what does it look like? This slide here I've borrowed uh, from AWI's um, Ramping Up Repro Workshop in conjunction with Zoetis. And I think it's a great slide and these are great, really famous pictures about what brucellosis actually looks like. So here, this is the picture of the testicle. On the right hand side, uh, this is a normal testicle. So we've got, you know, nice, even, they're symmetrical. We've got the epididymis up here and there's the tail of the epididymis, as you can see with my little uh, green dot. And we go back up here in the blood vessels here. Interesting enough, one of the cool features of, uh, you know, mammalian testicles is that the countercurrent blood system. So blood, because why testicles on the outside is because the factory has to run at a lower temperature than the body. So the blood going down the testicles is actually intertwined with the blood going away from the testicles to cool it down. Just a cool little side note. So bacteria gets into the ram, it finds its way into the epididymis, and here you can see all the significant damage that it causes. The abscessation, the fibrosis, it really, I suppose, renders the factory almost totally useless. Not totally, and I'll come to that. So we can see here, again, this, this picture here shows again, we've got a normal testy on the left, and then on the right, we can see the significant amount of swelling in the epididymis. Again, as you can see here, these lesions, when severe, aren't subtle. So with a little bit of practice, most producers will be able to pick this up. My caveat to that is not all rams that have brucellosis will end up with big lesions like that. Some will not have lesions at all, particularly in the early stages of the disease process, which is why blood testing is so important. So uh, the other point when we're thinking about these kind of lesions is there are several other types of bacteria that can cause these lumps. So if you've, in my experience, you know, 1% of rams, we could have lumps that are not brucellosis. But when you're, you know, doing your pre-joining ram exams and you're feeling any kind of lumps, that's your red flag to go, I need to get a vet in, I need some blood work, so I need to work this up. So that's in a rams. It's an infertility disease of rams. There will be, as you can see here, if you've only got one testicle affected, 
then you have still have some ability to, to um, get live rounds or, or normal sperm away. So that's important that a ram that has brucellosis isn't completely infertile. It really depends on how much damage is there and how much the challenge that ram got when he was infected. So what does it look like in ewes? Typically, uh, if there's ever any good news from a disease is that brucellosis, brucella ovus in ewes doesn't seem to cause them too much dramas. Uh, typically, if they get served by a ram because there's um, bacteria in the semen, they typically get over it in an estrous cycle or two because that's the, one of the mechanisms that happens when we have an estrous cycle. Uh, the prostaglandin goes up, corpus luteum and goes, hey, we didn't get pregnant, fire the engine again and also fires the immune system uh, in the uterus. So that's why we can get away with it. So typically in, a, in a, each a cycle or two, we can use can get rid of it and they're back in the game. You can get some infected fetuses. You can get, has been reported some abortions, you know, lambs born tiny and weak if they were born, I suppose in a um, brucellosis soup. Um, but we typically don't think of those as a major I suppose, manifestation of the disease. We certainly don't see it commonly, or I don't anyway. Um, I know there's probably a few government vets on board, so I'd be interested in your comments at the end. Um, but big one is no no U to U transmission. My only caveat, I have seen a paper that suggested that um, U's could carry it in the udder and then a, you know, a ram lamb per se could drink it and get a transmission. I have seen that written, but that's not certainly uh, not a commonplace. So, how do we diagnose? We diagnose basically by palpation, which is the fancy way for saying we feel the testes and we feel for those hard lumps. And the second way we do it is by using blood tests. And the way we do that is by detecting the antibodies in what we call a complement fixation test. You can see here, and this is, this is a blood tube actually of a ram I uh, took for a brucellosis screen. Um, and I just took that photo yesterday. You can see, remember, when we have blood, there's two things in blood. We've got the red blood cells, and we've got the protein and the serum. In the serum, that's where all the antibodies live. And so antibodies show up once a ram is infected in about three to six weeks after infection. You know, so what we wanna make sure is we know that um, they can secrete it with, within three weeks from getting infection, and it can show up within three to six weeks. And that's gonna be really important when we talk about how do we kind of attack it if we get it. But you can see there that we're going in the in the serum is where we're going to find the antibodies. So, what are the impacts? What are the impacts of the disease brucellosis in your flock? First of all, ramp infertility. Second, delayed lambing. Third is poor conception. And I'm going to put the fourth one as a as a genetic influence. And I'm going to explain those now. So, infected rams permanently either subfertile or infertile. So it's a career ender for a ram. Um, I'll put subfertile there because some rams, if they haven't got a lot of damage in their testicles, can go on to have um, lambs. If you've got bilateral, like two testes damaged, then I think that's a, you know, you're out of the game completely. But subfertile rams can still get lambs. So, if I said that they're permanently infected, there's no treatment for brucellosis. It's a uh, you know, real test and, test and cull or eradication program. So then I think about, well, what's the cost to my business? If I'm running you know, 3,000 ewes, and I'll use 3,000 as just a, an easy number to play around with, then you know, for 40 rams, so you've got 40 rams at the $3,000 you know, cost of replacement, we're looking at $120,000. So the cost of you incurring brucellosis in your flock, if you eradicate, if you have to get a new ram team, is $120,000. So it's a six-figure disease if you get it. Always, uh, I know there's when you use simplistic calculations, it's all not as straightforward, and the economists will tut tut some of the things I'm going to say next. But basically, I've just called BOE, back of envelope, just to make it really kind of simple about how I think about the costs, or maybe how do we allocate the cost of a risk to our flock. Again, if you get brucellosis, this is a significant problem to your flock. So the next part is poor conception. Now, this, this graph here, I've modeled that out myself, just on my own personal experience, 
And this is how I typically see brucellosis when I've been involved in detecting it and diagnosing causes of reproduction failure. You know, in a normal in a normal joining, normal um, five week joining, uh, six week joining, we're going to have about you know two cycles, maybe a bit more. So you know, typically we'd see ninety plus percent uh, use conceive. What we see with brucellosis, particularly when you've got a low number of rams infected, is that you know we'll just get about ten percent either off conception or, or lambing rate, depending on how well your sheep are ovulating. You know, from there, year two, you know, we see it drop down. This one becomes a real big one, 30%. And then by year three, we're looking at, you know, 50% loss of conception rate. So half your ewes are not conceiving. Why, why does that, uh, I suppose, transition? And it's all about the proportion of rams that have brucellosis in your ram team. Now, I will say you can go from a normal year to you know, to Bruso year three, this is just something I've modelled out. You could do that in a year if your rams are incredibly, um, I suppose, have got a ton of, uh, I suppose, energy in their system. Put it that way, um, and you know, say this time of year, um, photo periods right, a lot of sexual activity, you'll get a lot of spread. So as the proportion of rams you have increases with brucellosis, the chance of them a bit, a, their ability to serve use and conceive, so get a viable pregnancy drops. And that's why we see this here. Now, I've, I have have ex extended it out to cycle four and cycle six, because I wanted to show what happens if you had long joinings. Because I think there's some challenges when we look at, well, the question gets asked, what breed is most you know, susceptible? And I, I think of it less about what breed, although some breeds will be more sexually active at different times of the year than others. I think about, what production system is more susceptible than others? And I'll come back to that comment. Uh, so year one, we might see a, you know, a 10% loss in conception rate. Year two, 30%, year three, 50%. So often when we get to that point, I feel sometimes brucellosis is a, a train wreck that was three years in the making. Because if we're not always asking ourselves the question, if so, why so? If not, why not? And looking about if we are, 10% below what our normal scanning rate. If you don't have a good reason, that's when you need to start getting help in from your advisors or your vets or whoever is in your system and trying to work back because the last thing you want is to have that problem culminating and building up, sorry, over a couple of years. And this is just a scanning screen, typically how you might see that come through. So going back to trying to put some numbers about this, how much, how much risk is it? Um, if I said, you know, we had 3,000 ewes, maybe we're, we're crushing it and we're doing really well and we're weaning 100%. I know some people wean less, some people wean more. But if we said we're weaning 100% and I just made a figure, $75 I'll put on a weaner, then for us to get brucellosis in, our, in terms of our reproduction losses, we're looking at $22,000 in year one, $67,000 in year two, and $112,000 in year three. So these are massive impacts on your business, not only in terms of cash flow straight up, but as it plays on throughout the year or in years. So the third way I think it impacts um, flocks is delayed lambing. So like I said before, we will have, you know, ewes, the great news about it is that ewes can cycle again, but that's a cost to our business. For you to cycle in a first cycle and not conceive actually costs us um, because those lambs now in our system are going to be smaller. Um, and we know that when we have a longer spread out lambing period, which is why we like to go from six to five weeks in joining, we want tight joining periods because our husbandry systems work a lot better when we have really tight um, animals to um, conduct husbandry op op operations, but also to market them. So what happens there is suddenly we've got these ewes that through no fault of their own, we've done all the hard yards, we've got them to body condition score three, but now we're putting in a dud ram team. And so this you who might have conceived here in our first cycle now ends up conceiving out here. And so that, again, in my theoretical model, that's costing us in our business. So how does that look up if I just did some really uh, rough and dirty back of envelope kind of numbers? If I said the delay in cycle, 
costs you 200 grams a day in, in growth rate. 17 days, you cycle about every 17 days. 45% dressing percentage at six bucks a kilo, I made that up. So it costs you about $9.18 a lamb for that delay. Um, so we got 30% of our lambs now are delayed uh, through no fault of our own. Again, we're looking at that, you know, $8,000. So again, we've already seen a cost. Interesting when I thought about looking at these numbers here, this is a good case for teasers and for trying to synchronize those ewes out of season joining, so before uh, December 22. And we talked about this in the seasonality uh, webinar. This is a good case for, you know, um, using teasers. Bring those girls forward, conceive earlier and get bigger lambs. Um, bigger lambs, bigger weaners. And we know weaners that hit high, higher weights have better um, survival ability, um, less mortality, less morbidity, providing they're growing strong. Where I think going back to that question about, you know, do breeds have more chance of getting brucer than others? And I'd come back and say, I think it's a production system thing, is they've certainly been involved in a lot of shedding operations in Western New South Wales. And because they've got much extended joining periods, or if you are running a, an eight week joining period, then what happens is that you don't actually notice that spread. So are you here in cycle one? gets joined, doesn't conceive. She, you know, gets around cycle two, gets joined, doesn't conceive. You know, cycle four, cycle six, and as the story goes on, particularly if you're continuously joining. So if you're running an operation or your neighbor's running an operation that has continual or really extended uh, joining periods, you don't actually see that wastage or inefficiency in your system. And that's why I think those production systems, because a lot of those systems won't be scanning, there'll be no line in the sand to go, oh, geez, my scanning result is 10% lower because it's all more of a kind of harvest and, um, and looking at marking percentages. If you don't scan and if you have extended joining periods, then this delayed lambing will be much more subtle and you won't realise that this is costing you a lot in your business. <clears throat> Pardon me. Fourth impact, genetic. And I suppose this is the one where I don't have a really good dollar value, but we know it costs. We know that there's animals in our system that um, as we spend money on rams, we'll take that for, through. Every ram that we get in our system, every, sorry, lamb we get in our system, reduces the cost of our operation. It gives us more um, surplus animals to pick from, which means we get to pick the ones we want, and it means we get to improve our genetics at a faster rate. So if we've got brucellosis, one, and we have to get rid of our ram team, well, that's an epic dint to our genetic progress because now we've got to go out and say in this example, we're going to go out and find 40 rams that will suit our um, breeding objective. And we know that how important that is. We also got to, you know, the rams that we get in, do we have to change our um, trajectory? But also the rams that we, if we're going, oh, we've got brucellosis, we're going to get some more rams, maybe we'll get a you know, B grade team because you don't want to spend much money. That's all going to play in and cost us genetically um, in our system. So there is a genetic cost to brucellosis as well because we could even argue that the best rams are going to get brucellosis because maybe they're the most fertile. They're the guys, you know, in the MLP projects who are getting 80 lambs each, who are getting 100 lambs each, the real heavy hitters, the Don Bradmans who are making a ton. So they're the four big impacts that we've talked about. So what happens if I, if you, if your rams get diagnosed with brucella ovis? You've really got three options and none of them are particularly good, unfortunately. One, is to cull the ram team and start again. It's an infectious disease. You know, we I talked about that rams can get infected and be infectious within three weeks. Um, and the blood blood testing could be a little bit of a lag on that. So it's a real challenge if if you're not putting it really to the sword when you're trying to do a test and cull. Because the second option is to try test and cull. If you're spending three thousand dollars on rams and you've got a hundred rams, that's a lot of capital there. You know, if you've got a low proportion of ram, lower proportion of rams that are infected, then a test and cull operation is a really good idea. However, I do have some, put those photos in there for a reason, is that the identification, if you are going through a test and cull uh, program, the identification is absolutely critical. Every time you test and we get another positive, we have to start the clock again. 
and again, so we're testing, you know, it might be every two weeks, which is generally how I think about it. The more aggressive you can get with the testing, every time one of those RAMs comes up positive, we need to color. So, you know, so down to eight days, you know, has been advocated for testing programs. So you've got to get aggressive, but it all falls apart if 69 is positive and 96 is not, but we don't know who's who. We've got 269s, which I've seen happen, or 296s, or whatever the number is. So it's super, super essential that if you are conducting a test and cull program, that you have identification absolutely nailed. For that reason, uh, when I'm involved in eradication programs, uh, I'm bringing EID. I'm not, I don't trust my eyes, uh, particularly if we're doing large numbers of RAMs, because we get tired. We're all, you know, we're all awesome attention to detail up until it gets hot up until we get tired, up until we get to 50 rams, up until we start talking about the cricket. You know, whatever it is, we're humans, we get distracted. Um, so we wanna make sure we've got systems in place to minimize the number errors as much as possible. And I think EID is essential anyway to do that. The third option is to get to kind of live with it a little bit. And that's by saying, well, We've got, I'll make a number up, we've got 100 rams, got $300,000 worth of uh, capital. We can't go and spend another $300,000 in 2023. What are, what are my options? And that's when we start thinking about, well, can we phase this through and can we do a clean flock and dirty flock? Basically, we're trying to play to the, I suppose, if you could call it the advantage of brucellosis, which is the use typically, you know, get over it really quickly, is that we go through and we identify those rams who are blood positive or have only got small little lesions that we don't think will be significant, put those together into a group of ewes and we'll call them the dirty flock. Now we're putting sub-fertile rams together. So we don't put them out at our normal percentage. We have to absolutely you know, rack that percentage up. So it's kind of like we're putting a footy team out, but the bench has to play as well. Everyone has to play because we have no trust in who's doing what. So we've got to increase our ram percentage over here and then bring in new rams and start a new team here. And basically over time, we cull out this dirty ram team. So, you know, anyone who's uh, has got anything to do with biosecurity will be shuddering in their seat at the thought of this because we're a high risk. That's a high risk play, isn't it? We've got brucellosis rams on our property and we know about it. So to do a clean flock and dirty flock on a note, <clears throat> um, you know, if you've got a brucellosis program, problem right now and you're about to join, you're going to probably have to play that card. Um, or you're spending a lot of money on rams. But the idea is if we go through, we've got to go through with, you know, full knowledge and eyes wide open. And we've got to really make sure our biosecurity, our internal fences are really rock solid to make that work. So interesting just to go a bit high level. Um, this is the 2015 uh, MLA cost of endemic diseases to the sheep industry. Very, very interesting. Brucell overs, brucellosis doesn't even make a mention, which I find absolutely fascinating. And I'd probably challenge it a bit. You know, when I think about if, you know, if you get a prevalence of 50% in your ram team for brucellosis, you know, the test and cull could take you a long time. Sometimes it's just easier to start again. And I think about the number of, I suppose, cases that I've been involved with, I've got vet friends who've been involved with, and I think that would rack up really, really quickly without talking about production losses, without the delayed lambing, without the poor conception rate. So I really challenge that it doesn't make a mention because I think it does um, have a big impact in the industry. However, I will accept that maybe I've got a bit of vet bias on. So I thought, um, I know uh, I get chipped a bit for just running rugby analogies all day, every day. So I thought I'd mix it up and think about, you know, how do I think about brucellosis? If, <clears throat> if the MLA data is right, and it's not a big cost to industry, but it might be a big cost to you. So I thought about it and thought, well, maybe it's a bit like flying in a plane. So this is uh, some photos I took the other day. Uh, Will McAlpine up at the Mara took me for a bit of a burn around, look at this ponding, um, which looked fantastic. And I thought about flying in a plane is probably a little bit like brucellosis. You know, so when we look at our risk matrix, so when a risk matrix is how we kind of look at a risk and decide where it sits, what's the probability of happening? For me, uh, you know, for an engine failure in a plane, what's the probability of happening? Well, it's pretty low. It doesn't happen very often. 
However, the impact, is it small or is it massive? And I'd argue that an impact of having a plane crash is pretty big. So even though the chance of it happening is low, it's still got a fair bit of risk. <clears throat> Hopping in a small plane, just the same as driving a car, or it has a certain level of inherent risk. So there's some moderate risk in there. Now, how do we manage that? You know, um, Will up there, he's got a main schedule, you know, he gets things um, looked at, serviced properly, follows his logbook, you know, flies to conditions. All those things are risk management strategies to stop, you know, untoward things happening and trying to put things in place to mitigate untowards outcomes. So uh, that's all good until you're, you know, in a flat spin heading out to sea. You know, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of Top Gun fans out there. And we all know that, um, you know, it's all great to have a risk matrix, except if that happens to you. And that's how I started thinking about brucellosis. Brucellosis is like the is like the plane crash, is that the chance of it might be low, particularly if you're taking risk mitigation strategies. But if you're involved in a plane crash or you get brucellosis, you know, we're in a big issue. It didn't work out so well for Goose, God bless him. But what we can do is we can start looking at things well how do i mitigate that risk as best possible you know and i put that cross there for all those people um you know and i know there's a few out there who bought rams from sale yards you are looking at a massive risk for brucellosis it's you know i probably wouldn't go to the sale yards unless i was really keen on you know trying to get a bit of brucellosis so here's this is the risk matrix i think of brucellosis is that <clears throat> the chance of getting it if you're doing some good biosecurity practices is low, but there's always a risk there because the impact of onto your business, we just looked before, it's six figures, it's massive. Okay, so that's great, Tim. Uh, how do we prevent it? Or what strategies can we put in place to make sure we stay down here in the moderate risk, not the big risk category? So first up, biosecurity, and the second one is pre-joining RAM exams. So, biosecurity 101. Uh, first rule of biosecurity, a bit like Fight Club, is trust no one. If your rams leave your farm, go to the neighbours and come back, or a stranger ram turns up, trust no one. Segregate for six weeks and get a blood test. Again, the consequence of having the plane crash is too high just to go, oh, she'll be right, mate. My second one is, do not expose uh, lambs, rams to lambing ewes, especially, pardon me, especially if they're trade, trade sheep for at least two months after the last lamb. Like I said before, uh, we don't typically see abortions as part of uh, the brucellosis kind of picture, but it can happen. So it's a risk, we should mitigate it, you know, and not join um, lambing ewes till two months after the last lamb. So there's no retained placentas or anything like that. Third one is utilize strategies if stranger rams join you use. The prostaglandins and things like that I think are very useful in that um, situation, but you've got to use it very, very early to be effective. So again, biosecurity is key, and if in doubt, get professional help. So um, my next step, and for the 20, uh, maybe it was 35% of you, is um, only buy rams from brucellosis accredited studs. So in Australia, um, we've got accreditation programs. Each state's got one, and all and all stud animals that are merino, not necessarily all other breeds, have to be accredited. And that's basically a risk mitigation process. In their first year, they get tested a couple times. They get blood tested every year for a couple of years, every second year for a couple of years, and on to every third year. Now, so it's a quality assurance program. It's not not rock solid perfect but it's better than nothing it's the best we've got so buy rams from brucellosis accredited studs and your stud should tell you now that is important for all rams regardless of breed so if you've, you're getting your merino rams from brucellosis accredited stud remember it's all about the weakest link but you're getting your border rams for your tall girls from you know dave down the road you're still at a massive risk so um all breeds should be from brucellosis accredited and all reputable studs I think would be. Now, if you if you go down to Dave and he's got great sheep and you're buying those rams down there and he's not accredited, go back to biosecurity rule number one. Trust no one, Dave might be awesome, 
but make sure when you get those rams, segregate them and get your vet in to do a blood test. Go, you know, take them, you know, we got the rams in the trailer, um, go through, take them through and get a blood test from Dave. So that's biosecurity 101. That's about getting to the disease. Can we mitigate the risk of the impact of the disease on your farm? And my answer is yes. Conduct annual pre-joining ram exams. So a really common old vet saying, an old jungle saying is we miss more by not looking than not knowing. And I 100% believe that to be true in sheep farming is that by not looking at our rams every year, we miss those opportunities for one, those sub-fertile rams anyway that we see in our situation, but also we'll miss those early stages of brucellosis. <clears throat> and, you know, getting brucellosis is bad at any point, but we don't want to wait till it infected 30, 40, 50% of our ram team. So we can use a tool called the pre-joining ram exam, which is part of our management procedure every year regardless. So, you know, a ram team, uh, they're, they've got 80 minutes to play, they've got five weeks to do all the running around. We want them to score as many tries as possible. To do that, they've got to be in the best um, condition they are. And we know for our, you know, our footy players, there's, you know, depending on where you are, uh, we've got a lot of New South Welsh people, so I can roll with the rugby analogy for this AFL in there for anyone else, um, that we know we wouldn't let our athletes take the field without a pre-joining, you know, stop pre-joining, without a, uh, you know, pre-game fitness test. We shouldn't let our rams. So in some survey research, 10 to 20% of rams are unsound. 8% under three years, 35% at six years. So we've got a ton of rams out there. So they got five weeks, six weeks. That's the start. That's the really big thing that's going to drive the profitability and production of our business. We've got to get that right. So how do we do a pre-joining ram exam? We look at the four T's. Teeth, testes, toes, and tackle. So, whoop, wrong button. So teeth, again, we miss more by not looking than not knowing. Flip the lip. We can see there, you don't need to have a vet degree to realise that animal's unsound. It's all about trust. We can't have rams getting around there and expect expect awesome outcomes that we can put on Facebook. We can't do that unless we've got sound mouths and good body condition scores. Testes, again, this is what we're talking about. And that photo on the right, I took that photo. <clears throat> you know, rams that have got severe lesions on their testes won't be able to get lambs. You know, so we've got to make sure that we have all the confidence we can in their ability to do that. To do that, we want to examine Every, every ram, because they've got 80 minutes, we've got to make sure, 80 minutes, six weeks, five weeks, we've got to make sure that they're nailing everything they possibly can to get all the results they can, score the tries. To do that, they need good scrotal circumference and they need functional testes. Toes, again, another ram I took a photo of. Again, without their ability to get around the paddock, find the use and also eat, we won't get the best result we can. We spend a ton of money on these animals. We need them to perform because every lamb they get um, decreases our capital cost per lamb. So we've got to examine the toes. The fourth one is tackle, and that's a little bit harder. That's getting that penis out. Um, we can do that on the board. And um, that's on the left is me doing some semen collection. And on the right, that's at the Wyvern weekend there, just flipping a ram back. You know, um, rams can get penile abnormalities as well. And you can see the little urethral process there. Uh, again, if you wanted the top level of risk mitigation, you know, you'd have a look at that and make sure that's there. Um, that can be a bit more challenging. So if you're trying to go, oh, Tim, I don't have a lot of time, then in the race, you can do your pre joining ram exams really, really quickly. So um, taking a step back from that and go, okay, why is it so important to do this? And it's all about the long game. So I love this graph. It's a little bit complicated, but hang in there for a second and just follow the colors. What this shows is that a ram's influence in female progeny over time. And we can see here in 2019, we buy this ram, we join him. His progeny enter our program you know, in the daughters, 2022, 2023, 24, 25, 26. We get him, he joins four years. His granddaughters are now in our system. They're kind of coming through their breeding, 2026, 2027, 2028. Where I go with this is that in 2035, we still have granddaughters, so a quarter of his genetics, we still have granddaughters in your system. So we don't want to go, you know, two weeks before joining and go through our rams and go, geez, 
30% of my ramps are Brusso or 30% of my ramps are completely unsound for joining. And now I've got to go and find, you know, genetics at moment's notice that will set my breeding objective and take my flock forward for the next 16 years. That's a massive ask. That's why doing pre-joining ram exams, you know, 10 to 12 weeks before joining gives you awesome opportunity to one, get your ram team ready, but two, if you have to find replacements, remember, it's like buying a car that's gonna last you 16 years plus. You don't wanna do that on a fly. You wanna put some thought and research into that. So, that's, so that works in our favor. It's the miracle of compound interest, but it goes against us as well. So where do we do it? Pre-joining ram exams, um, which drive your production but also they're the cheapest Brousseau insurance you can do. You know, there's a whole heap of handlers in the race. I love Combi Clamp, I got one. Um, Tom Graham here is a vet um, near Gunner Guy. He's actually got a ram cradle to do this pro properly. That's him down at Wyvern teaching the other weekend as well. Um, there's a whole series of things out there that can help you do this, make it easier for you. Because the other thing I think about when I think about pre-joining ram exams is I want to get the most out of my ram team. You know, we just said before, if we've got 40 Rams worth $3,000, that's pretty close to a Land Cruiser. You know, we wouldn't let our Land Cruiser sit around our farm with a flat tire, which is kind of what's happening when you've got your Ram team kicking around there, got worms, they've got flies, got terrible feed, and we know that's happened in the last year. So it just kind of reminds you, there's a lot of capital tied up in your Ram team. You know, you want to treat it um, and put a maintenance program in just like you would a car. Because this is based on, again, you know, 3,000 ewes, um, I think, you know, weaning a fair, 100%, so you're doing well. Um, if you get one year out of your ram, it costs you 30 bucks a lamb in capital. Two years, 15, three years, $7.50. Again, back of the envelope stuff. But what I'm saying is that taking care of your ram team and you get one more year out of that ram, you know, that significantly decreases your cost of capital of that lamb. And I think that's really, really important. You want to get the best bang at a, you know, out of your ram team as possible. So remember, testes are just a sperm factory and it takes six weeks to make the goods. So to go from woe, you know, woe over here, the factory out to live rounds takes about six weeks. So how can we manage our ram team? One, you know, we need to think about worms. Our ram teams typically come out of the ewes and they go into the ram paddock, which is where they stay all year. It's set stocked. It's a small paddock typically, and there's a lot of them. So they're at a high stocking rate. They can get really high worm counts without looking sick, but it affects it affects the factory. Anything that affects the ram will affect the factory. Fly, particularly the horn guys, vaccinate, I think twice a year. Um, that's the recommendation as well. Um, again, they're your athletes. You're paying a ton of cash for them. You know, you want to take care of them as best best as you can. Um, they do a lot of fighting and typically you'll feed them grain at some point in time. You want to keep that vaccination status up. Rising nutrition, you want those guys taking the field at body condition score 3.5. Um, I like lupins, some people don't, um, but lupins, high protein helps um, increase scrotal circumference, increase the fuel tank, uh, so they've got more sperm to operate in their short joining period. And feet, again, I look at that, that's their ability to get around. Once their kind of feet start really kind of spying out and everyone's seeing those, um, their ability to break down will go up. We want to get the most out of them. So we want to be trimming their feet, you know, look at their feet twice a year, particularly when it's wet. This pick here is a checklist from uh, the pre-joining um, part of the Ramping Up Repro workshop. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I love checklists and I think uh, this workshop represents a ton of value. So again, what can we control in our environment? Um, we can control when we schedule maintenance. It's just like a car, you know, so pre-joining and I do that um, minimum the factory takes six weeks. Anything I want to do to my ram, I don't want to affect the factory. You know, so six weeks out is bare minimum um, for um, uh, any kind of management. And I just forgot to chat there. And that includes shearing. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, when you sedate a ram for shearing, that it makes them infertile. It's not the ace promazine, the yellow drug you use. It's actually the fact that they're stressed and they get really hot. So you've got to manage that. That's why we want to do those things. It is a risk. Some guys get away with it. Um, it is a risk, but we want to do anything that's going to affect the factory. We want to do that at least six weeks. I like 12 weeks out because I know uh, we're all humans. If I put in the calendar at 12 weeks out from joining, then it's probably going to happen about nine weeks in. 
So I've got time to manoeuvre, got time for a rain event, got time to something for something to go wrong. Pre-joining, but also I think pre-sales are probably a good time to put in your calendar as well. Again, do that, you know, half yearly check, um, go through their feed, and it gives you an opportunity to go, okay, I'm going to have to shop a bit this year. It gives you time to make informed decisions. Your decisions last a long time. Want to make really good ones. So where to next? Ramping up repro workshop run by uh, AWI um, in conjunction with Zoetis. Um, speak to Megan Rogers at Sheep Connect if you're interested. They're a fantastic day out on farm. We talk a lot about and get producers to get hands-on experience um, palpating testicles. Like I said before, brucellosis, um, by and large, you'll be able to feel that early in the piece. And you want to make sure you're doing that really well. And the second one, where, where to next? Uh, get a vet out um, or get a professional out. Um, like we looked about before, the cost of brucellosis, you know, in a 40 RAM team, if you have to get a new RAM team, $120,000. The cost of repro failure uh, from brucellosis, you know, significant one is, again, $102,000. We're talking a quarter of a million dollars. No one can afford that in their business. So insurance policy, the problem's quarter of a million dollars um, for our insurance policy, pre-joining RAM exam, Bruso test. Um, I think most vets out there are probably charging $25, might be less actually, um, might be a little bit more. But long story short, 40 RAMs, $1,000. It's actually, the insurance is actually so cheap compared to the potential problem if you end up unlucky enough to have that plane crash. Um, this is a photo of a group of vets getting together in Bendigo Sale Yards last year. Um, interesting enough, um, we were getting ready, refreshing for foot and mouth disease. Found a you there with um, virulent foot rot. Um, with EOD, the sale yard guys could tell us where that you came from in about an hour and a half. Amazing, which is why EOD is so important. Won't prevent the disease, but it's so important to get rapid tracebacks. <clears throat> So uh, as a consultant, you know, I watched the gurus in the game like Jason Tromf. You meant to throw out some really big uh, sayings to, um, you know, to rattle the crowd. A bit like anyone who's a you know, business fan, your big, hairy, audacious goal. My big, hairy, audacious saying is if you conduct pre-joining RAM exams annually, the chance of you having a reproduction failure due to Brousseau is almost net zero. That's not saying you might not get brucellosis because that's a biosecurity issue. But the only thing worse than getting brucellosis is getting a brucellosis in your RAM team, but also reproductive failure, where you're pushing those ewes up into the scanning crate going, what's this guy doing? What's this girl doing? She's putting, putting. she must have got my draft wrong. They're all going in the empties. That's that's worse. We can prevent that bit. And I think that's why pre-joining RAM exams are absolutely essential. If you've never done one, don't know what they are, ramping up repro workshops, amazing, or get a professional. You know, it's really um, pretty cheap. Guys, I've gone fast and furious. Um, thank you very much. Uh, purpose of our business, help producers grow their best sheep and make every year a winner. Hope I've uh, stuck to that today. Uh, we have kicked off a bit of self-plug, a uh, new service, Sheep HQ. I'm trying to provide a Zoom level service. I've got a few people, you know, interstate who are dealing with brucellosis right now. And as just described, it's a huge problem, massive problem to your business. Um, if you're looking for, you know, advice, um, we've got that service to go uh, to Zoom. But my final parting comment, we're all about controlling the controllables. Um, the day your RAMs go in is the day you should be booking your scanner. I know people, a lot of people are joining now. So if you haven't booked your scanner, scanners are like every other professional who services the sheep industry. Um, they get really busy in seasonal. So get on the top of the list. Um, if you put your RAMs in, haven't booked a scanner, um, this is your friendly reminder to do so uh, today because we want to scan 90 days after RAMs go in. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, Fiona, over to you. The questions, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. That was great. That was a jam-packed hour just about for everybody. So you've got an awful lot of information to process there. We've got a couple of questions that have already come through, so we're going to kick off with them. But now's your chance to pop them in the question pane, not the chat box. You'll see the question pane on your thing. Drop it down, type them in, and we'll kick off with them. Um, so first question is, typically what percentages of rams within a flock will become positive if I have an outbreak? Yeah, great question. Again, it all depends 
on uh, the amount of time since you uh, you first got the Brousseau incursion um, and the time of year as well. So you know at the start of if you if you got some um, brucellosis rams that came in in July, you know the spread of that disease because they're not very sexually active will be pretty low. So you're going to have a low proportion of rams in. Um, you know compared to peak breeding season now we'll go up. So you can go from you know, zero to 50% uh, within a year. But typically, I think my gut feel is that it progresses over a couple of years. And that's why, like I said before, doing the pre-joining RAM exams, if you're on farm doing it um, by palpating, if you find anything that's unusual, you just hand up, call in a vet and get a blood test. Um, so yeah, brucellosis can be from, you know, 1% to 50% before you really start, you know, kind of feeling the pain. Thanks, Tim. Um, if I'm not buying a ram from an accredited seller, is there some way I can quarantine or test the rams um, to prevent an outbreak? Yeah, great question. And that's probably the big thing. You know, I was trying to be a bit funny about trust no one, um, but you know, um, in all seriousness, you should be really putting that by security. So if you're buying rams from a non-brucellosis accredited flock, then how I'd be playing that is um, when you're coming home with your rams, I'd be calling your vet and organising a time to get them tested. I'd be putting them in a paddock away from any other ram, away from any female, and I'd be discussing with your vet about how you do that testing. Um, but I wouldn't be putting any rams from a non-accredited flock with any of my rams um, until um, I've had a you know, negative blood test and at least one because um, remember um, they can go from um, secrete brucellosis in three weeks but they could take up to six weeks to get um, positive on a blood test so ideally you know you take them home six weeks on home completely isolated blood test negative and then they're right to join your ram team. So Tim, following on from that, because the question's just popped up, yep. how long does an accredited flock maintain their status um, before they have to be checked again? What's the process to become accredited and what do they have to do behind the scenes? Yeah, great. So um, the process is basically what happens is when, a, uh, say, a stud wants to engage to get um, Bruce Lass's accredited, Typically at the start, they'll have to go through a series of blood tests and usually they'll be, you know, six weeks apart. And because what we're trying to do is assess the level of risk. Part of that risk assessment will be to examine the, um, the fencing um, and make sure that that is uh, adequate and suitable and assess really the production system to make sure that, you know, it's a sound one. From there, they'll get a series of um, blood tests and then it becomes an annual event. So every year a vet will come on farm, and do the blood tests. Once they've gone through a series of those, then it becomes every second year and every third year. So, you know, really established studs, merino studs would have a three yearly cycle um, to go through. But part of that will be that they'll have to sign a form that says, <clears throat> you know, if there's any biosecurity breakdowns, we have to get our RAMs blood tested. And they've got to find a whole series of uh, I suppose accreditation principles and guidelines that they have to adhere to to make sure that when they sell a ram, they're selling you know a high level of certainty that their rams are fit for purpose, but also brucellosis free. Thanks, Tim. I guess that's why you just said don't trust anyone because there is few could be holes in that system. Next question, do we have any decent data on the flock prevalence of brucellosis in say different breeds, location and production systems? Uh, great question. Uh, I'm not aware of it, uh, if there is. Um, if there's any other vets online who want to um, add to that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I don't think um, we have really good data on breeds or uh, particularly not in, in Australia. And, and that's why my comment about the MLA data was, is just, I think I think it actually is there and I think it probably costs a lot more to industry than um, that 2015 data suggests. Uh, but the challenge is like the plane crash analogy is that, you know, if it only happens at, you know, if only a uh, hundred, sheep farms have got it and but you're next to one of those hundred it's still a super high risk and that's why it's, it's such a challenge but that would be awesome data to, to see out there. Yeah absolutely. 
If you, last question that I have, so if anyone wants to ask a final question, now's your chance, because we'll close up after this one. Um, if you test positive, Tim, are the use a threat if you're going to go for a test and cull for the Rams? My answer to that would be if they're pregnant, they would still represent uh, a threat. If they, if they're currently joining, I think sexual activity, while ever you've got sexual activity with the Rams in there, because remember some Rams might be trying to, um, you know, increase their, uh, I suppose, dominance behavior, so they might ride each other. So if there's a joining event happening, I think there's a risk. If they're pregnant, I think there's a risk. And so the way to manage that is that we need those ewes who are joined by Rams who potentially uh, boost losses positive. They need to lamb out in an area that are not exposed to any, uh, any Rams um, at all till two months after the last lamb because that fetal material could be infectious. If you know if you are self-replacing um, rams like a stud situation, then I think that you know you'd want to be testing those ram lambs at sexual maturity as well. But um, yeah, pregnant ewes um, could have a risk. That's why the test and cull you know really is all about um, testing all the rams, but also segregating the rams as much as possible. You know it sounds silly, but if you could get them you know into pens of one that would stop the disease spreading, wouldn't it? So the smaller RAM groups you can have, the better it is um, to stop the spread till you kind of can catch up to that, you know, that blood coming positive from infection. Great, thanks, Tim. That's the end of question time. Thank you everyone in the audience for participating in the questions. It was great to get so many through. Thanks again, Tim, for the presentation today. It was great to have you joining the Sheep Connect webinar series once again.